Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started in just a few minutes and allow everyone a chance to log in. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to go ahead and get started and I'll hand it over to Ash COO, Elizabeth Ferguson. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to this webinar on the role of all healthcare professionals in cessation. Our webinar today is brought to you as a collaboration between our partners at DC Health, the DC Tobacco Free Coalition and Action on Smoking and Health. This is the DC Coalition's annual Calls at Quits Week, which is our week-long advocacy push to raise awareness on the harms that tobacco use continues to inflict on our communities, and also to highlight resources available to help smokers quit and quit for good. The coalition was created in 2006 with financial support from the district's tobacco settlement funds. Our mission is to improve the health of the District Columbia residents by decreasing the morbid morbidity and mortality associated with tobacco use and exposure through education, public policy, and advocacy using culturally and linguistically competent approaches. Please join us tomorrow at our DC Tobacco Control Summit. It'll be taking place virtually from 10 in the morning until uh, 1245 Eastern tomorrow. Uh, registration is free, though space is limited. Um, and uh, I believe that we have a link in our, our chat box. Um, if you're not yet registered and you're interested, uh, please join us again. Uh, space is limited, so, so definitely join as soon as possible. Uh, moving on to our program for this afternoon, uh, we have four speakers joining us today. We have Jasmine Devonish with a public health analyst at DC Health, Charles Debnam, Deputy Director of Community Wellness Alliance and Program Committee Chair with our DC Tobacco Free Coalition, Jeremy Holbert, Account Manager with Optum, and Dr. Ricardo Fernandez, Chief Medical Officer with La Clinica de Pueblo. Um, we'll have a brief Q&A session following our presentations today, so please submit your questions in the Q&A box as you have them. There's no need to, to wait until the end. Um, speakers? Um, uh, we, uh, I'll invite you to um, share your screens um, and again, very briefly introduce yourself, introduce your organization, tell us a bit about your work, and then I'll invite you to begin your presentations. Jasmine Devinish, I believe you're our first speaker today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Liz, and please excuse my mask. At the health department, we are still masking here. Alrighty. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here during DC Calls at Quits Week. My name is Jasmine Devinish. I am the public health analyst at the DC Health Department within the Tobacco Control Program. And today I will be speaking about the tobacco landscape in the district. So first we are going to discuss tobacco use in DC. So in general, cigarette smoking rates have been declining. The US rate as of 2019 is 16% compared to the rate for DC, which is 12.7. New data from Burfis for 2020 shows an even bigger decline of 11.3% of current adult smokers within the district. Although DC's rate is steadily decreasing, smoking rates are disproportionately high 
among certain populations, including African-American Blacks, LGBTQ, to name a few, leading to many disparities, which we'll talk about in a second. Here we have some important data that we should all keep in mind as we're doing this work. So we have 6% of DC adults reported smoking cigarettes, cigars, cigarellos every day or some days, and 2.7% of adults reported using e-cigarettes every day or some days. Now the crux of our work, my work, your work really lies in this data point of almost 63% of current smokers within the district stop smoking for at least one day this data set is critical because this tells us that there is a large number of residents who want to quit and have the readiness to do so. And here you see within the ward map, the ward map, we see the stark differences between more affluent wards compared to wards that experience challenges with low income, low educational attainment, lack of access, and that could include transportation, food, jobs, and healthcare. Now let's discuss the disparities within the district. So here we have a graph displaying tobacco use prevalence. And while the smoking rate in DC overall has been declining, there are disparities in who is most likely to smoke. And the rate, as you can see here, of African-American Blacks who smoke is over three times that of whites. While smoking is a behavioral choice, that choice is largely influenced by the environment. And studies have shown that marketing tactics of big tobacco targeting low-income neighborhoods in the district. In Washington, DC, tobacco advertisements in predominantly African-American Black neighborhoods is 10 times that of advertisements in predominantly white neighborhoods. And African-American Blacks are more likely to use menthol tobacco products and are more likely to try to quit. However, they are less successful in quitting compared to whites. Overall, 62.8% of smokers want to quit and have quit for at least one day in the past year. So here we have the associated risks of smoking and tobacco use increases the risk of many cancers and chronic diseases, most associated with lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. Smoking causes cancers such as kidney, colon and cervical cancers and chronic conditions, including lung disease and reduced fertility. Smoking also increases the risk for tuberculosis, certain eye diseases like glaucoma and macular degeneration and problems of the immune system, including rheumatoid arthritis. Nationally, secondhand smoke exposure contributes to approximately 41,000 deaths among non-smoking adults and 400 infant deaths are caused by secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke causes stroke, lung cancer, and coronary heart disease in adults. And children who are exposed to secondhand smoke are at increased risk for sudden infant death syndrome, acute respiratory infections, middle ear disease, more severe asthma, respiratory symptoms, and slowed lung growth. Smoking not only reduces a woman's chance of getting pregnant, but also increases the risk of pregnancy complications. Other risks of smoking during pregnancy are preterm birth and low birth rates. Smoking can cause damage to the baby's lungs and brain and raises the risk of birth defects like cleft palate. Babies of moms who smoke during their pregnancy and babies exposed to cigarette smoke after birth have a much higher risk of sudden infant death syndrome. Here are the numbers for the district. And you can see here the health outcome disparities related to tobacco within whites versus blacks within the district. Those who smoke more, there are more risks to their health. Higher rates of smoking is related to higher rates of diseases among African-American Blacks.
Here are the benefits of cessation, which many of you are familiar with already. Cessation improves overall health immediately. These changes happen almost instantaneously, starting within 20 minutes, where heart and blood pressure decrease to the risk of disease come 15 years is significantly lessened. Thank you. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, and to our participants, please, if you have questions for Jasmine, please uh, remember to send them um, in the Q&A and uh, we'll have the opportunity for, for Jasmine to join us again and, and answer those uh, following all of our presentations today. Um, up next, um, please to introduce Charles Debnam, who is the Deputy Director with the Community Wellness Alliance and also the Program Committee Chair with our DC Tobacco Free Coalition. Charles, over to you. Thank you, Liz, and hello to everyone out there and welcome DC Calls It Quits Week. Um, happy that you guys are here. Thanks for inviting me to um, do this presentation today. As Liz mentioned, I am the uh, Deputy CEO for uh, the Community Wellness Alliance. I am also the Program Chair for the DC Tobacco Free Coalition. Um, so I'm excited today to be talking about tobacco cessation support and introducing in some ways uh, and also talking about the Ask, Advise, Refer model to help healthcare providers integrate uh, tobacco conversations and tobacco cessation into their already existing programs. So the Ask, Advise, and Refer is, um, is a, a provider training. It's based on the um, tobacco, uh, treating tobacco use and dependence, which is the public health service guidelines. The uh, Public Health Service Guideline was um, created by AH, AHRQ, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, in 1988, and then updated in 2002. So um, a few myths to get out the way before um, I go into my presentation um, is that some that we hear a lot, and I do a lot of this work, cessation work in the, in the community in DC, is that smokers don't want to quit. We know that that's a myth. Seven out of 10 smokers do, in fact, want to quit. They just don't know how to take that first step, or they, in some cases, are too afraid to take that first step. We hear, especially from a lot of women, that they don't want to quit because they're afraid that they're going to gain weight and, and other reasons why. Healthcare professionals can't help. Again, we know that that's not true. Patients that are advised by their doctors to quit are more likely to make at least one quit attempt. And then treatments don't work. Um, we know that well-designed smoking cessation programs that include uh, nicotine replacement therapy can achieve 20 to 40% success rate. So in saying that in the medical setting, the key role um, and the, is uh, that of the physician and other providers um, and I'll define other providers um, in a minute, but 70% of smokers visit their physicians yearly. That's a great opportunity for education. It's also a great opportunity for intervention as it's relating to uh, tobacco cessation. And majority of smokers report that they've never been advised to quit. They may have had a conversation, their physician may have asked them, uh, if they smoke, but they've never really been advised to quit, or at least they report that they've never been advised to be quit. And that most smokers will make a quit attempt um, upon advice from their uh, healthcare provider, from their physician, a nurse, nurse, even a dentist. And so for the um, purposes of this presentation, definition for a healthcare uh, professional is a nurse, uh, physician assistants, uh, pharmacists, dentists, outreach worker, community health worker, and case manager, anyone that comes in contact with the client that is trying to uh, quit. Um, and so uh, a fact about uh, DC, uh, TV commercials are the number one reason um, that smokers call the quit line. And you'll hear a whole lot more about the quit line um, in the presenter after me. Um, and that healthcare provider referrals is the number two reason. Uh, we see that change a lot right now. They're currently, and this may be um, happening in your area also, that when the TIPS commercials 
are showing um, uh, referrals to the quit line are high or calls to the quit line are high. But once those commercials stop, then healthcare providers uh, sometimes move up. And that up to 46% of calls to the quit line have been healthcare provider referrals since the quit line began. Um, and so let's look at some of the numbers. Look at some of the good news um, about all of this. 35% quit for at least one day per year. Um, in the district, 62.8% of the residents stopped smoking for at least one day. And then more than 50% of people who have ever smoked have quit. Well-designed smoking cessation programs that include nicotine replacement therapy can achieve the 20 to 40% success rates that I mentioned earlier. Um, the bad news, or not the bad news, but the challenge is that less than 10% less than achieve abstinence for a year. Um, and so then there are resources that can help with that. And that's uh, programs that provide free services, um, such as the quit line. Um, they provide nicotine replacement therapy uh, to assist smokers in staying quit in the process. Um, I do a lot of work out in the community, especially with people who are trying to quit. And one of the motivators that I use is, you know, when you're asking folks, do you know what you're smoking? Do you know what's in tobacco? They'll say, yeah, they'll say nicotine. They'll say sometimes even carbon monoxide, but they don't quite know that there are five to 6,000 other different chemicals that are in tobacco. And so I like to include this and maybe give this as a handout to include some of those chemicals that are in tobacco. And so once a person sees this, they kind of, you know, it it's, it's falls in line with the stages of change. It moves them from one point to the other. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And so let's talk about the public health service guidelines. Again, like I said, it was um, developed in 1988, but then updated in 2002 um, and probably should be updated recently. It's a simple protocol for providers to counsel smokers as indicated in the guidelines to increase the patient's quit attempts using the five A's. In 2002, they had one um, uh, addition, and I'll talk about that. It's used to tailor counseling, which is based on the stages of change in the quitting process. It uses resources, local resources from uh, the DC quit line, Bree DC, um, and uh, the DC, uh, DC Health. And it looks at treating tobacco dependence with a chronic disease model. Um, I know Jasmine talked about um, pregnant smokers and women who are pregnant that smoke. Uh, it also has information in that that helps nurses counsel parents on the consequences of active smoking um, and the exposure to tobacco smoke. Also counsels women on the risks of secondhand smoke exposure to infant children. And it also uses, uh, encourages folks to use the uh, the local resources along with the quit line. And so the public health guideline for healthcare providers, again, uses the ask, advise, um, or the five A's. And they are ask, every patient should be asked about their smoking status, the advise, which is to discuss the importance of quitting for the individual. I'm gonna skip over this part here. It also uses assess, uh, patient's ability to quit, determine, you know, the social support, the financial issues, et cetera. It also um, addresses the assist, determine what can be done in a um, clinic or in a hospital to encourage the patient to quit, and then the arrange, the follow up, the support. In 2002, it actually came out with um, some recommendations. We know that you know when you're dealing with healthcare providers and you're dealing with a client, you don't always have the maybe the 20 to 30 to maybe even 40 minutes to really address all the issues that one needs to address when um, uh, uh, talking to someone about quitting smoking. So the the model that we prefer to use is the ask, advise, refer model, and so it, it talks about using the ask. It talks about using the advise. And then the refer, you refer the, folk, the, the client or the patient over to the quit line um, and other community resources. When you do that, the quit line can then do the assessment, um, it can then do the assist, and it does the arrange. And this is a benefit to the provider and to the patient because it uh, allows the uh, provider to spend a little bit more time with the patient talking about other issues. 
The Ask Advisory Fur, I created this um, as a pocket guide that I've given out to quite a number of folks in the district that I have done the Ask Advisory Fur training with. It, it serves as a reminder to always um, talk to your patient about smoking, whether they're a smoker or not. Um, and then it also on the back offers some resources. Again, the quit line, other local resources, maybe a text messaging program, et cetera. So this is a pocket guide that we give out to folks that are um, participating in our Ask Advise Refer trainings. Um, a new way of viewing progress in smoking cessation is not defining success by the numbers of smokers. That can be discouraging, but looking at it from moving from one stage to the net next um, in this um, stages of change process. And here's the model. I know we all probably heard of or seen or even used the stages of change model. Here it is. And what that is, it provides a framework for understanding and segmenting the process of behavior change. It offers an alternative to other approaches that tend to view people as uncooperative or resistant or maybe even in denial. Um, it views motivation as a state of readiness to move through the stages of change and proposes a predictable pathway for behavioral change. Motivating a smoker to, to make a quit attempt, um, you wanna look at personal relevant health risks. Um, and I know that Jasmine talked about some of these in her presentation and then pointing out the links to current and future illnesses. Look at exploring motivations and look at values be non-judgmental, advice, um, advice to quit, be clear about the importance to the uh, patient's health. You wanna make sure that you also address the patient's fears. This is also an offer, offer opportunities uh, to sample cessations you know, during um, events like the Great American Smoke Out um, and through smoke-free places. Um, African-Americans, uh, studies show that uh, higher levels of nicotine and cancer causing tobacco products in blood and the urine, also higher rates of lung cancer, although they tend to smoke fewer cigarettes because of the menthol, they actually inhale a little bit deeper, uh, prefer higher nicotine and tar levels, and then menthol may enable them to take smoke deeper into their lungs. And that is, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you guys for listening. I will turn it back over to Liz. And that's my um, information. I'm sure this will be provided after the presentation. It will be. Thank you so much, Charles, for a wonderful presentation. And, and please stick around because we, we have some questions uh, that have been emailed and also in the, the Q&A um, for both you and Jasmine uh, at the end. I will, thanks. All right, and with that, I am pleased to produce or uh, introduce um, our next speaker, Jeremy Holbert. He is coming to us um, all the way from Washington State today, um, and he is an account manager with Optum. Um, Jeremy, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Liz, and thanks, Charles. Thanks for inviting me to speak today. <clears throat> um, we here at Optum are proud to support uh, DC Health and their partners with DC Calls It Quits Week. Um, so just a quick background, um, Optum has been the provider for uh, DC's quit line for about 11 years, uh, and so we continue to support the district's effort um, to help everyone in the district quit uh, smoking. So I just want to go over the quit line, um, just kind of give you a quick little background on Optum and DC Health. Um, we work closely together with the quit line, give you an overview of the services that are provided. Uh, Charles did a a uh, spectacular job just kind of teeing it up and talking about the ask, advise, um, refer model, and we kind of take it from there. And then I do want to explain to you just a little bit about our provider referral options and how you can get someone to the quit line. Um, as Charles and Jasmine mentioned, uh, the TIPS campaign is a huge driver. Um, it's easy entry, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And so we see a lot of people call in um, and get into the quit line that way. So I want to go over kind of some of the traditional options for referring to the quit line, as well as maybe some options that you may use in the healthcare provider setting. So just a quick background on Optum and um, the state quit line. So here at Optum, we have over 30 years of experience running um, uh, state quit lines. We're the current uh, quit line provider for 23 of the state quit lines. So we're the largest provider in the United States. 
Um, like I mentioned, we have uh, over 11 years that we've been operating the DC Quit Line. Uh, we're a founding uh, member of the North American Quit Line Consortium. Um, and we were selected by the American Cancer um, Society ACS to be the operating partner for the Quit Line services for their states. Um, and then we contribute to ongoing research. We work closely with the CDC. Um, we've published over 150 publications, and we continue to take on research initiatives in the world of tobacco and cessation. So I just wanted to give you a quick visual glimpse of the, our footprint in the United States. So we uh, work with over 23 state uh, and U.S. territory quilt lines, including Guam and D.C. Um, more than 4 million lives helped, and that is a a number that just keeps growing daily. Um, we also help um, over 800 clients across three different markets in the uh, commercial space as well. Uh, one of the big benefits of being with Optimum in the DC quit line is we're also the same service provider for Maryland and Virginia. And we realize that a lot of folks will be calling that live in some of these states as well. Um, if, for example, if someone does call that live, you know, someone that lives in Maryland and calls the DC quit line, it's a seamless transition back and forth to services, same staff and coaches, there's no um, transfer. And it's a universal phone number for any resident um, of the district or these states, 100 quit now will automatically route them through. Um, one of the big benefits of working with the neighboring states in the district um, is promotional and reach opportunities. So for example, uh, we see advertising in Virginia um, and Maryland that also affects um, quit line volumes um, and callers in uh, the district. So I just wanted to quickly go over an overview of just some of the services that district residents can expect uh, when they do call and enroll in the quit line. <clears throat> So just a quick glimpse on how someone would access the quit line. Like I mentioned, the most common and easiest is 1-800-QUIT-NOW. You'll automatically get into the DC quit line if you're a DC resident. Uh, we also have a web portal uh, where you can enroll online through quitnow.net slash DC. Um, and then also I mentioned at the start, we have uh, more traditional provider referral options to get into the service. Um, so after they uh, get referred to the quit line, whether it's through the phone number or through a traditional method, um, they'll then enroll in services. And when a, um, a resident enrolls in the services in DC, uh, they have a choice on what um, services they want to um, get from us. So basically, we have an integrated program, which is kind of the full um, cessation services, which includes um, counseling services over the phone. So we have inbound and outbound. So uh, we schedule calls, uh, four additional calls uh, to the uh, resident to help them quit smoking. And those are custom scheduled based on the recommendations from our program and then also the participant need. We also provide a texting, uh, it's called text to quit service where um, residents can get texts and prompts through their phone to help them uh, stay on track and quit smoking. Um, we also provide a generous benefit of nicotine replacement therapy that includes patches or the lozenge uh, to help um, the residents quit. And this is free to all residents that call the DC quit line. We also have an interactive web coach program, which helps individuals um, uh, quit through the web and also they can uh, talk to other community members that are quitting smoking and then also we have a written and online available quit guide which is a really good um, guidebook to help you quit smoking. So also we have a web only program which an individual can can enroll in if they don't if they prefer to do it uh, without phone coaching we can do that they can also get nicotine replacement therapy through that program as well. Uh, they get access to web coach and the written materials. Um, they can also upgrade at any time. So say if they're in the web pro only program and struggling, we can go ahead and put them back into the integrated program. And then in that, in that program, they could get those outbound calls. We also have individual services, which is kind of our a la carte uh, method of entry. So in this program, the uh, tobacco user or resident can pick which services they want. So if they just want to get, let's say, uh, the nicotine patches and they feel like they can, you know, they have other services and other counselors or they're working with a, 
uh, um, a family member to quit smoking and that's just how they want to do it, we're fine with that. Um, we can send them um, a starter kit of nicotine replacement therapy, four weeks of the patches to get them started. Um, and again, with this, this program, they can also sign up for text to quit. They can also sign up for emails. Um, or if they just want to call and do text to quit and that's it, that's fine too. Um, so those are kind of the, the services that we provide. Now, just to kind of go into this more, um, so we kind of have these different tracks, as I mentioned, uh, the integrated program, which has all of these aspects of the program that are included, the web only program, which does the phone or web enrollment as well. Um, and like I mentioned, four weeks of the nicotine patch or lozenge, um, and then individual services. Uh, think of this as the a la carte uh, method of our program. So I just wanted to highlight too, um, in the integrated program, we we provide the full FDA recommended uh, level of nicotine patches or lozenges uh, in the web only program and the individual services program. If a resident does enroll in that, we do provide four weeks of the patch or lozenge uh, to get them started. These are both of the programs that we see most residents of the district enroll in with the integrated program uh, being the most. And um, we do find that uh, the particip participation level is high in these programs. Uh, Optum is constantly monitoring, watching how you, individuals in the uh, programs are utilizing services. Um, so individual services uh, kind of reaches, we've found in the district that the individual service program has reached residents that otherwise may have not called us uh, due to maybe some barriers with the phone, um, or they just prefer not to engage with a coach, and we're fine with that too. So um, these three uh, program tracks uh, are really helpful for every resident of DC uh, to choose from. So next, I just wanted to go quickly over some of the provider referral options for healthcare workers in the district. Um, just kind of give you an outline of how you can get someone over to the DC Clinic line. So for providers and healthcare uh, professionals, we have three different methods. We have the traditional fax referral method where um, you can fax refer a patient to the quit line and we will call them within 24 hours to help them enroll into the program. We also have the ability to do HL7 full um, EMR uh, electronic health record referrals. That's coming soon for select providers in the district. And then also we do have secure email option, which uh, if a healthcare professional or provider wants to secure email, um, a um, referral form to the quit line, you can do that as well. And we will um, fax outcomes back to that organization if you're HIPAA compliant. And that's kind of the next um, part here. So outcome reports are returned to those compliant organizations and providers. And then like I mentioned, uh, outbound calls are uh, made within uh, 24 hours of receiving a referral. Um, so we make five or more calls at the patient's uh, best time provided. And then just wanted to give you a view of which numbers might show up on caller IDs. Uh, since we know nowadays 800 numbers um, on caller IDs can uh, kind of be be confusing. Um, one hundred quit now or eight six six quit for life often will show up. So again, the fax referral program is probably our most popular program for providers to fax in uh, referrals. So this gives you just a quick glimpse of what the form would look like. Um, we also have that option of secure email. So if you have a secure email service, you can um, email us the the form and we'll process it process it the same way. Um, or if you're doing batch referrals and you prefer to do that in email, you can do that as well. Um, so you would engage with Jasmine or someone at the at DC Health and we would um, assist you with testing that service and uh, getting that going. So just for an outcome report, what you get from that, um, if you do fax someone in, you get the clinic information, the name and date of birth of your uh, uh, patient, the service status, so if we reach them, they declined or accepted, and if they did enroll, uh, basically what they choose, what they chose uh, when they enroll. So one call, multiple call, uh, and what nicotine replacement therapy um, they chose if applicable. So I just wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to speak, and, um, and yeah, thanks, and I'll hand it back to Liz. Thank you so much, Jeremy, uh, terrific presentation. Um, and, and I do notice that we have a couple of questions for you as well. So if you wouldn't mind hanging on, 
um, in, until the end of our program, um, we'd like to make sure that you have the opportunity to, um, to, to answer those. Certainly, thank you. Thank you. Um, and that brings us to our final presenter today, uh, Dr. Ricardo Fernandez. Um, he, Dr. Fernandez is with the uh, Clinica del Pueblo here in the district, but I also believe that they have an office in Maryland. Um, Dr. Fernandez, are you here? There you are. I'll invite you to share your screen and, and introduce yourself and um, you're welcome to, to begin your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, are you able to hear me? Okay. We can, very clearly, thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you for having me. I was asked to come and speak about our um, workflow related to uh, tobacco cessation. We're a federally qualified health center in Washington, DC and in Maryland uh, with several um, family physicians, family nurse practitioners and internal medicine physicians. And um, so we're gonna just do a brief overview of the, of the workflow at La Clinica. Just uh, by way of background, we have two sites, one in DC, one in Maryland. It's about 4,500 patients, maybe closer to 5,000, 35% of whom are uninsured. Um, we do family and internal medicine. We also do HIV care. We have integrated behavioral health, which means there are behavioral health, uh, mental health providers that work closely with the medical team and can support us with um, issues that might include even um, substance use and people's uh, assisting people in, in, uh, in stopping substance use. Overall, our population tends to have low rates of tobacco use. Uh, there's, among other substances, it's mostly alcohol rather than other uh, drugs. Um, many of the tobacco users that we identify are casual smokers um, or, or think of it as, uh, you know, they hardly smoke and so it's, it's not that important to them uh, that they quit and sometimes they need some convincing. So we have a, a dashboard that we use to look at um, screening rates and uh, cessation. And this is just a, a snapshot, an example of the dashboard. So in the green, you see, you know, of uh, 2005 patients who had encounter who were eligible for um, screening, um, how many received uh, the, the screening questionnaire and there were 42 who did not. And then in the second bar is, uh, you'll notice among 2005 patients, there were only 107 who were identified as current smokers and uh, who had received the uh, cessation advice that was documented in the record and 32 who had not. And then the third bar is just kind of a composite of those first two. So our expectations for the, for the providers and the medical team is that um, smoking status is um, assessed at the first visit and then updated at least annually on all the patients who have a visit. And we use eClinical Works as our electronic health record. And this is documented on what's called a smart form. It's just a structured uh, questionnaire about smoking use uh, by the medical assistant or the, by the provider. If the patient is uh, identified as a current user of tobacco, uh, expectations, we advise them to quit. And in, in that case, we would uh, want to assess the pattern and quantity of use and their readiness for change as, as we've um, heard um, in, in earlier presentations today. Um, we would want the provider to offer prescription for cessation medication if that's appropriate to the situation and refer them for counseling if appropriate. And that can be done internally by our behavior health providers who've gone through some training. Um, in addition to the, the primary care providers, we've gone through some training on um, helping uh, patients uh, quit tobacco use. So we have this uh, available internally in case for providers at, who are often very busy, don't have the time in, within their visit to do all the counseling that might be um, helpful. And then we would uh, provide uh, phone number for quit line, if that's appropriate as well. And so among the interventions might, uh, might include uh, medication, which I've given some examples, barencycline, 
or Chantix, bupropion, or Zyban, nicotine replacement. Uh, and I wasn't planning to go into detail about the use of those, but the, it would be the provider's role to prescribe those if that's appropriate and the patient agrees and counsel them on the use and the side effects. And as I said, we could refer to the behavioral health specialists who have received training on this and then provide that quit line information. So we have uh, to, as to assist with this, we have built into our um, EHR some clinical decision support which uh, is called CDSS, and it alerts the users um, who are working with the patient and looking at a progress note if the smoking status questionnaire has not been updated or documented in a year. And it will show the date it was last performed. Then uh, also, if the patient has been identified as a tobacco user, it will provide an alert if there has not been any documentation of cessation um, advice or counseling or in other intervention in the past year. However, um, unfortunately, as with a lot of things in the electronic record, you have to use a certain structured field for this to actually work. So this is just a, an example of a progress note and uh, it's probably difficult to see, but on the left is sort of the progress note and on the right is a box that pops up when you click on this CDSS, that's the decision support. And so among other things, it will show when the smoking status was updated, the dates, and if there is a smoker, it's the cessation advice that was documented. And if it's in green, that means it has been done within a year. If it's in red, it means it has not been done. And that's the, the cue to, to do that uh, particular thing. And then when you uh, are in the progress note and you click on that appropriate section, it'll pull up a questionnaire, a structured questionnaire that asks if the patient is a current smoker, um, and then if so, how often and the quantity, et cetera, the pattern of use. And once it's in the progress note, it looks like this, the answers to the questions, they're a current smoker, how often they smoke, some days, but not every day, and then the quantity and some additional questions. Then uh, for the counseling, when that's being done, we ask them to document that in a different section called preventive medicine. So it can be captured. And uh, so that's here, you click here and you, a box opens up and you're able to document uh, that on this particular day you provided counseling, whether or not you prescribed or discussed medication. And then you can also open up this to display the phone numbers for a quit line. We have a couple options there. And then once that is done, it will display in the progress note. And uh, then we print out a visit summary for the patient at the, at the conclusion of their visit. And that will be on the visit summary and the medical assistant can highlight you know, once you've discussed the provider, the provider discussed um, the quit line. And so here's the numbers that the patient could use to call the the quit line. So that's just a brief overview of our, of our workflow in our primary care clinic um, using the electronic record. And um, that concludes my presentation I, and I can answer any questions that people might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernando. That was a terrific presentation and, and wonderful um, sort of case study um, of um, uh, how these uh, cessation tools can be applied um, uh, within um, the role of healthcare professionals. Thank you so much again. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a number of questions, which I'd, I'd like to get to, and, and I know we're, we're going to be running short on time. So um, presenters, uh, please stick around. Um, we'll, we'll try to get through them quickly because we want to make sure we have everyone's questions uh, answered. Um, and I'm going to start with a, a question that we received via email um, prior to the start of our webinar today. Um, will you please address the apparent trend by tobacco corporations such as Philip Morris International to invite policymakers, the scientific community, and NGOs to review and verify um, a PMI's scientific findings regarding smoke-free alternatives. 
Um, it's obvious that the industry is trying to convert smokers to smokeless sources of nicotine. And I wonder how this will affect longstanding strategies to, com to combat tobacco use. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and just um, and answer that on behalf of Ash so that we can move on to our other questions. A terrific question. Thanks so much for, for submitting that. Um, so I'd like to say tobacco companies are consistently trying to get our public health community to engage with them. So this is really no different. Um, internal uh, Philip Morris International PowerPoints even said that their own strategy is to maximize on the harm reduction debate to divide the health community and confuse governments. Um, at ASH, we follow the recommendations in the World Health Organization's Tobacco Treaty, which is the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which includes an article specifically on how the tobacco industry has no place in public health. Um, article 5.3 of the treaty text says that there's an irreconcilable conflict between the tobacco industry and public health, and we stand by that um, here at ASH. Thank you again for that question, and, and thank you for sending it in, in advance. Um, another emailed question, Charles, this is for you, um, if you could, could unmute. Um, the pocket guide um, that you referenced in your presentation, um, is that available via hard copy or, or can it be downloaded on your website? And if so, could you provide a link? Uh, <clears throat> yes, it can be provided hard copy and I can actually send um, a link to Ash to get out. Terrific, thank you. Um, next question, uh, Jasmine, I believe this is for you. Um, have you seen any, any research that tries to determine why menthol cigarettes are favored by Blacks? Yeah, thank you so much, Joanne, for that question. So research has shown that tobacco companies have done extensive marketing of, of tobacco products and menthol products in particular in African and Black communities. Um, African American and Black communities and communities with low socioeconomic attainment. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, terrific question. Definitely um, rare, very relevant um, to, to all that's going on in the tobacco control community now with, with menthol and, and flavored, flavored tobacco products, especially here in DC. Um, Charles, another question for you. Um, you mentioned that the quitline commercials are very effective in encouraging people who smoke to consider quitting. What is usually portrayed in those commercials that make them so impactful? And also, do they feature a healthcare worker or do they capture real people with real life testimonies? Uh, that's a great question. And um, one of the things I think I neglected to mention, but I think someone did mention that these are commercials that are produced um, out of uh, CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So I did wanna make sure I said that. So we call them the TIPS commercial. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they are actually commercials. We know that people um, tend to be visual. So when they see someone that is a smoker or an ex-smoker giving their testimony, they're more likely to make that quit attempt or at least reach out and call the quit line. So they feature people who are uh, currently smokers or who have smoked in the past. Thanks, Charles. Charles, very popular. Um, we have another question for you. How do we reach out to Charles if we're interested in him doing a, um, a training for health providers in, uh, they said in our training, but I believe they meant in their, in their community or their yeah. training efforts in their community? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you. And I think you guys are going to be sending out the, uh, the slides later on. And my contact information is in the slides. Terrific. Thanks, Charles. Um, next question, um, in, in Charles or Jeremy, either one of you could answer this, I think. Um, are there any efforts being made to include stress relief programs into quit programs? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, here at Optum, we have different arms of the business and different parts that help with, um, you know, diabetes and stress management. And so we're actually taking the initiative to incorporate some of those uh, modules in our web um, portions. Um, our coaches are also trained um, around stress management techniques, deep breathing. Um, so when we talk about getting through kind of moments, uh, trying moments when you're trying to quit smoking, I think the stress kind of comes into that, uh, plays into that 
really big. So our coaches know to kind of talk through that um, and help them to not only, you know, get through the craving in the moment to help develop healthy behaviors when it comes to managing stress. Cause, cause yeah, I mean, like you said, that's, a, there's a key link for a lot of um, smokers and tobacco users to, you know, when they're stressed out, they reach for the cigarette. So now what do I do? Thanks, Jeremy. Um, another question, um, uh, this is a toss up for Charles or Jeremy, you, you both may want to weigh in. Are there any funders who are willing to support those who are attempting to quit by providing additional NRT beyond the initial supply, especially when employment and barriers to health are so evident? Great question. That's an awesome question. I think that's a, the part of the uh, d- dilemma that we have here in the district is actually trying to find a funder that is willing to pay for you know additional NRT. Um, I will say that the um, uh, the quit line does a great job in providing, and Jeremy w- went over this, and he'll probably talk about this at providing. We know that it takes about you know a six to eight week course of NRT, um, and so they do provide that. Um, if they're interested in being in, in the long-term plan. Um, but right now, as far as, you know, funders, um, I will say, if you know of someone, let me know, because we, we'd love to know that information too. Um, right now, I can't say that I know anyone that provides funding for additional NRT. Yeah. And then um, uh, just real quick, can you remind us for those that are district-based, what, what exactly is provided when, when people call the quit line? How much? Um, it just I, I know someone. Yeah, yeah, Charles, if you don't mind, or, or Jasmine, either one of you, just just very quick reminder of what's available for district residents. No, well, Jeremy probably can answer. Well, I'm sure Jasmine too, but they can get the free counseling services. They can get, I think Jeremy mentioned either eight, six to eight weeks or four weeks supply of nicotine replacement therapy. They can mm-hmm. also be invited to join in the text messaging program. I'll stop there because I think they can actually elaborate on that a little bit better than I can. Yeah, Charles, you're right. So, so we provide uh, eight weeks of NRT, which is the full FDA recommended amount. So we'll be send it in two shipments. So we send four weeks at the start. And then after they've started it to make sure it's working well, then we send another four week shipment and that's directly to them in the mail. Um, so that takes care of it. Uh, we know that some individuals will use more than that and that's fine. The FDA has authorized that titration methods like nicotine lozenge or gum. So we do have some individuals that may stay on it longer and may save that money that they've you know, saved from not spending it on NRT and then, and then moving forward. But, but that takes care of it. So every resident's eligible for that, um, regardless of insurance or anything, as long as they want to quit. Um, the other four weeks um, starter kits are designed to help them start out. And that's why in those services with individual services and web only, Um, They don't have uh, the additional calls that we're calling and kind of working with them through it. Um, But yeah, that's kind of that methodology there. And and I kind of want to go back to the partnership portion. So I mentioned before a little bit about Optum having commercial quit line services for employers and health plans. So that is the case in the district as well. There are some employers and health plans that have contracted services with Quit for Life. The benefit of that is if a DC resident calls us, but we find that they're eligible for that service, we'll get them over into that service. So it's, it's, you know, being a provider with having all of those contracts and and maybe some in the district in Virginia, Maryland, and, you know, up and up and down the East coast, um, they can get into those services. You know, the Quilline is, is a free services, free service for all. So right now it's encompassing everyone, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of some ways for, I know that some employers require uh, someone to quit smoking. Health plans also have that too. And they um, also kind of funnel people into our service. So um, just wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit too. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Carrie. Um, Carrie Dock with Hi everyone. I am the program manager uh, with DC Health Tobacco Control Program. And I'm having some technical difficulties here, but I did want to mention if it wasn't um, mentioned previously that um, insurance is required to cover nicotine replacement therapy and tobacco cessation treatments per the Affordable Care Act. Um, so if you have someone who has access to Um, NRT through the quit line, but they feel like they still need more. In addition to some of the suggestions that have already been made, I would say look to see if that person has insurance 
because they can be prescribed insur um, NRT and insurance would cover that. Thanks, Carrie. Um, uh, and we do have a few more questions to get to here, some technical questions. Um, can those ECW functions be shared for free with other systems who use the ECWs? These are quite amazing. Um, I believe that most um, or all electronic health records have uh, clinical alerts that can be customized, but not all, I'm not at all familiar with um, other systems. And there's one issue with the electronic health records that, they, that the sharing is not very um, advanced. So um, that unfortunately you'd have to go in and customize it yourself. And many providers have not done much work on this because of uh, it's something that providers can, can tend to ignore, you know, pop-ups and things like that. But it, most systems have the ability to customize this type of uh, alert. Thank you. And a follow on to that, um, with the software for, um, for cessation, can a referral for lung cancer screening be a part of this tool? Does anyone know? Yeah, uh, in theory, it could. Um, this can be built into uh, the alert to where it might could provide a link to uh, a way that you could order something. In this case, it would be a diagnostic imaging for a CT scan. There's some flexibility that you might want to have that it wouldn't have. So if, if you if you want to refer someone for lung cancer screening, it should be someone who has a certain history, pack year history of smoking. It's not every smoker that you're going to refer for that. So the system would might have trouble distinguishing that, but you could you could certainly uh, theoretically build that build that in. Thank you. Um, uh, another question for, um, for Jeremy, um, are other NRTs being considered for your quit lines like, uh, Nicorette and, and gum, other gum products? Yeah. And, uh, and that's something that we can provide. I think I, I would defer to Carrie or Jasmine on that. I know we've had some discussion on that, uh, you know, the lozenge is, is works with around the same method, um, which is a titration type method. So we can provide that. I also noticed there's a question regarding kind of combination NRT therapy. Um, just a quick answer to that one too, <laughs> as I answer this one is that that's currently not available uh, for the district um, is the combo therapy. But, um, but we, we do know that, like I mentioned before, some individuals might do that on their own um, with the patches. Say they have the patch and they go and buy the lozenge or the gum. Uh, so we, we have information, we could support them with that and maybe help them with decision support, but it's not directly provided from the DC quit line. Mm -hmm. um, and then while we're, we're talking about the multiple options, um, there, there's studies that, um, that the use of two NRTs at once is more effective. Can individuals get patches and, and other forms at, at the same time, or is it just one? Yeah, just one from us that we ship to them. But, but like I mentioned, if they, if they find that they say, you know, it's not enough, um, they're using the patches line enough, you know, they could, of course, go out and, and, and buy that. We would just, you know, provide them device and guidance and, yeah, that sort of thing. Excellent. Thank but, you. Yeah. Um, so we, we are um, coming um, up to um, our, our time limit. So I'm, I'm just going to ask uh, one more question. And I'm just going to note um, to our participants, for those of you that have asked um, uh, requests for specific pieces of data to be emailed to you, we, we have taken note of your questions and we will get those back to you um, to, uh, as quickly as we possibly can. So if, if we don't have the, the chance to answer here, um, it, your question will not go unanswered. Um, but I just wanna close it with, with one last question here. Um, and um, the question is, how do you counsel patients who ask questions about risk to lungs for marijuana use? And do you count as quitters those who just quit smoking cigarettes but still smoke pot? Interesting question. And I realize this is a much larger discussion. Um, Jasmine or Carrie or, or maybe um, even Jeremy, um, does anyone care to, to answer very briefly this question? Yeah, I mean, uh, we are the provider for Washington, Washington, Oregon, DC. Washington has, um, you know, legalized marijuana, Oregon as well. Um, Washington, I live in Washington. We've had it for years. So we feel these questions all the time, whether, you know, it started, which is it, a, 
<laughs> is it effective to use marijuana to quit smoking? So we don't encourage that. Um, if someone quits tobacco, they quit tobacco. So we, you know, we, we foster that as a quit. We count them as quit. We celebrate with them that they're quit. Um, but it's kind of, you know, the coach will help with decision support, uh, help them figure out what to do to develop, a, uh, you know, a, a lifestyle that's healthy, especially to meet their goals. Um, so we most often hear, you know, that they don't just want to quit smoking. They want to also improve their health. So, um, so, you know, in the early days, it was a lot of like, can I use marijuana to quit smoking? And again, that links to stress and, and getting through cravings. And so we would kind of encourage them to go over to the FDA approved methods to quit smoking, such as, um, you know, the nicotine replacement therapy or Chantix or Wellbutrin. Thank you, Jeremy. That answers that. Yeah, thank you. And again, I, I do recognize that that probably is a part of a much larger discussion. And unfortunately, we're just about out of time um, for today. Um, so I wanna thank um, each of our speakers um, all of you, you had wonderful presentations. And I just wanna leave us with a few parting thoughts that are not only for our healthcare providers, but, but for all of us uh, really in the public health community. Um, first, uh, DC, District of Columbia is to be congratulated for our comprehensive efforts on cessation. Uh, the DC Tobacco-Free Coalition and Action on Smoking and Health are so, part, so proud to be a part of the outreach for, for cessation initiatives here. We urge health providers, businesses, and community organizations really to take advantage of their direct interactions to ensure that people who smoke know the benefits of quitting and exactly where they can find the help. As we see it, there's two opportunities for tobacco use prevention, stopping youth initiation and adult cessation. Cessation is the only form of prevention that has an immediate measurable impact. Um, I wanna remind you all that, that everybody is the winner when a tobacco user quits. It saves lives, it strengthens communities, and it saves money on the individual and societal levels. Cessation has traditionally been shortchanged, unfortunately, in tobacco control. In earlier eras, people who smoked were deemed the problem rather than the victims. And fortunately, this is changing. We have to remember that people who smoke are not the perpetrators of the tobacco epidemic. They're the victims. They should be seen as our clients, and everything we do from a policy standpoint should take them into account. Um, please remember that cessation is a human rights and health equity issue. As a society, we allow the tobacco industry to, play, to prey on children and particularly um, those among certain populations that already suffer from inequity. Our governments have a legal and moral duty to help people quit. Um, Cessation is a vital component of ending the tobacco epidemic. We hope that DC efforts can be an example to other jurisdictions, and we call on you to, to, to contact our colleagues here at DC Health to, to follow up with their initiatives here and what we can do in other places. And then finally, we encourage everyone who's thinking about quitting to call 1-800-QUIT-NOW to talk with a quit coach and put a plan in place that works for you. Help is out there. It's free, just call. With that, um, I'd, I'd like to thank um, our partners at DC Health, Dr. Nesbitt, uh, Carrie Dalquist, and, and all of her team in the tobacco control uh, program at DC Health. I'd like to thank each of our members from the Tobacco Free Coalition um, who've also joined us today. Um, I'd like to thank our production management team, Megan Arndt and Nichelle Gray, both colleagues of mine at ASH, for everything that they've done to produce uh, today's webinar. Thank you both um, for, for everything. And then finally, a big thank you to each of our participants for joining us today. Um, I know we've gone two minutes over time, um, but um, for any of those questions that we didn't have a chance to answer, please stay tuned to your email. Um, we will be sending an email out that will include a, a recording of the webinar, a link to each of our presenter slides, a link to Ash's cessation report, and then again, a link to register for the DC Tobacco uh, Free Summit, which we'll be having tomorrow. It'll be a virtual event, and I believe that we shared a link earlier, but again, it will be a, a link will be sent in the email. It's, it's free to register, but, but space is limited, so go ahead and, and register now if you can. And 